Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Because I live, you shall live also. Friends, we are gathered here to praise God and to witness to our faith as we celebrate the life of Catherine Madeline Wright. We come together in grief, acknowledging our human loss. May God grant us grace that in pain we find comfort, in sorrow we find hope, and in death we find resurrection. Alan, Maddie, Ethan, and all the loved ones and friends that are gathered here it would be silly to not acknowledge our loss and our grief and our difficulty in this moment. But in a moment as we move to a time of prayer to open, I want to encourage you with words from Romans 8. When Paul says nothing can separate us from the love of God. And that Christ Jesus, who died, and more than that, was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and he's interceding on our behalf. So even when our hearts don't know the words to pray, Christ is near and hears the groans of our hearts. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks for today, as odd as that sounds. For your presence is here, and you're hearing the cries of our hearts. So in the coming moments, Lord, will you pour out your grace so that we may find comfort, so that we may find hope, and pour out a peace that surpasses all understanding. Lord, be with us as we celebrate the life that you have given to Catherine and to all of us through her. We love you and trust you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. So Catherine Madeline Wright of Kingwood, Texas, she was born on March 25, 1969 in Harvey, Illinois. She spent her childhood in a community outside of Chicago, Illinois, before moving to the sunny Arizona. She was a 1997 graduate of Arizona State University, and she made a professional life working to serve students at Arizona State, at University of Mississippi, and of course, most recently, the U of H Law Center, a job that she enjoyed for over 15 years. Catherine loved her family, loved her husband and her children, loved her extended family and her friends, and her heart was filled with love, and that made her home filled with love, and all of those that were close to her knew that. She also loved all creatures, right, that her home could also become a shelter for animals, uh, rescuing homeless pets. I'm married to a licensed vet veterinarian technician, and I'm, we're always close to that moment, so I know your name. She enjoyed warm, sunny days on the beach and being outdoors, and she loved this community. She loved this church. I'm reminded even today as we, just a couple of hours ago, celebrated the end of Vacation Bible School, that that would be something that Catherine would be a part of. That she also served with my wife as the leader of a young, uh, young girl's small group. And she found many other ways to pour into this community in such beautiful ways. And also to continue celebrating Catherine, I want to share a couple of letters. The first is written by her dear Madeline to Catherine. To the most amazing mom, I love you so much. You're so wonderful and amazing, who couldn't love you? You impacted everyone you met on this earth, and so many people love you. At the hospital, lots of people came to see you. We had to tell them to, quit, to stop coming because the hospital waiting room couldn't hold everyone. The waiting room was halfway full of people who wanted to see you, and there was barely any room for anyone else. If everyone, and I mean everyone, who wanted to come and see you, the area would not be big enough. I know you sometimes thought that people didn't care about you, but you were mistaken as seen on this day. Mama, I text you on Tuesday morning not knowing that you'd never get the chance to read this, and so I'm going to write it this letter. It's going to be before you went home to God, but I want you to know what I said. Quote, I love you so much. Stay strong and beat this. You're amazing and God's with you. I believe in you and love you so much. You're the best mom in the world. 
and no one can say any different because you be because they be wrong. Stay strong, Mama, and keep fighting. I'm here for you, even if I'm not even physically there. Mama, I know that you're in heaven, which is an awesome place and way better than earth, but I miss you. I know you're happy there, and there is no kind of pain where you are, but it hurts here. I really miss you, and I know you're with Belle and Buddy and Daisy and Hershey and all the other animals <laughs> that we've lost through the years, so please give them all a hug for me. And oh, by the way, Drizzle misses you so much, she really doesn't know what's going on, none of the animals do. I know you're happy and you're with both yours and dad's family, and I'm glad you get to finally be with your mom. But I want to be with my mom as well. It sucks that you're not here anymore. This whole scenario sucks, and I know it's a part of my trial. Mom, please help me to be strong. I still and will always need you, even if you're only there spiritually, I need you. I will see you again, and I'm going to make you proud. It's going to be hard to do stuff without you, but I will try to remember. You're not gone, you're home. And one day I'll be home, and I'll see you. I don't understand why God uh, called you home so soon, but I will trust in Him. Acts 16.31, they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. He has a plan. That now I can't see, but I will in the future. I will as long as I trust in Him. Wednesday evening when we were on our way back home, the sunset was beautiful. On the right, the sky was a beautiful pink and purple. On the left side was where the sun was setting and the sky was lit with a stunning orange. The clouds covered the sun, but the color was vibrant. Mom in the sky, I saw you at the open gates of heaven with God and Jesus welcoming you home. I saw so many family members and animals who greeted you. There was a smile of peace on your face, and I couldn't help but feel the sunset was for you. To honor and celebrate you, to welcome you home. Love, Matt. And Alan writes courageously to Catherine as well. Catherine, you are the love of my life, and I knew it when we first met. Over the years, you would doubt yourself and question your self-worth. It was hard to see you do this. Looking down, you cannot deny the impact and importance you had on this earth. Now I know you are completely healed. I am happy you are reunited with your biological parents and our family members who have passed prior. Thanks for giving me two wonderful children who love life and love the Lord. You selflessly showered us with love and endlessly pampered us. The void you leave in our lives is immense, and we miss your smile and touch and laughter and silliness and also the annoyed look you would give when we would pick on you and others in the family. <laughs> Most of all, I will miss the unconditional love and support you gave me. We had an awesome marriage, trust, and we knew that we were always there for each other and our family no matter what. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for softening my heart. Know that you have made me a better man, and I will always put our children first. They are my number one priority. I will continue to teach them the things we learn the hard way so that they are wiser and more prepared for the world than we are. Most of all, I will tell them to love the way their mother did and enjoy the small things in life as you also did. The pain of your loss stings, but I will hold on to God's promise that we will be reunited again. All my love, Alan. What courageous letters that even you in your darkest time, in your mourning, you give us words that our hearts are trying to explain right now for our love for Catherine. Um, as you pointed out, Alan, that she liked to give you a hard time and others, and y'all enjoyed that. You were not the only one. She gave a lot of us a hard time. Uh, one thing in particular I figured I would share was in preaching one day, I let out this slip. You know those things in life that you've had wrong for way too long and someone finally corrects you? Well, this happened with our dear friend Catherine. Uh, I used an illustration of taking Mentos and putting them in Coca-Cola and making them explode for kids to see that. Except I was using the word Mentos the whole time. <laughs> uh, I thought that was how you would set it for 30 years of my life, and so 
a group of people corrected me in the middle of preaching. And then the next day, I had a, a package of Mintos and Coke sitting on the altar with a note from Catherine that has a proper phonetic spelling <laughs> so that I could pronounce it properly. She loved with such joy, and she blessed so many. And we're here to gather and, and celebrate that truth. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks. And I pray in the moments to come and in the days to come that you would continue to help us to laugh and enjoy those special ways that Catherine has touched our lives. God, be present in these moments. Comfort our hearts. Pour out a peace that only you can give. We give this time to you as we celebrate Catherine and the love that you poured into her. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, as we continue our worship together, I ask you to join me if you're comfortable with saying probably one of the most well-known scripture passages in the Bible, Psalm 23. You'll see it printed on your bulletin. This is a passage for forever that has been a place of comfort, a way to assure our hearts that the Lord is with us. So let us say together Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. At first it might seem odd to sing upbeat and joyful songs at funerals, but Catherine was upbeat, and she was joyful, and she was bright and shining. And today we will honor her with upbeat men.
Tuesday morning, I was uh, looking at all the Facebook posts, and I, I stopped counting about, uh, about 815 replies, shares, posts about Catherine. If she was standing right now, she'd punch me if I was crying, and she'd been doing CrossFit recently, so she punches pretty hard. <laughs> so I'm gonna try to do my best to power through this. Um, but man, all the people here, and all the posts and comments just show how loved this woman was. So our families have known each other basically since Maddie and my oldest daughter were born about a month apart. And we've really grown up together as families. Ethan and my daughter are also in the same grade, my other daughter. We've done lots of Sunday schools together, lots and lots of ministries together. Family promised many, many times together that we would host. Lots and lots and lots of baby days, days and sales. The woman loved baby days. Uh, she loved to share what they didn't need anymore, and she also loved to buy things that other people didn't need anymore. And then the next year, she'd give it right back. And it I taught the kids in Sunday school. Um, Alan coached my daughter in T-ball when she was the only girl on Ethan's team. And I may be the only person to snow ski, water ski, and jet ski with the family, which is kind of a great triumvirate of skiing that we've done together as families. So we're not related by blood, but uh, I'm definitely a brother in Christ uh, in my family and in Alan's family. Um, we're definitely related in Christ. And the, the day she passed away, he called and said, would you mind speaking at the service? And I said, yes, of course, I'd be honored to. And then last Saturday, we were driving to pick up uh, her best friend growing up, Debbie, and, this, and he said, you know, you, you were the person I thought of to come up here and share and speak some stories we're going to tell you. I said, yeah, why, why was that? And he said, well, you know, you've, you've been with us as Catherine has really grown in faith throughout the last 15 years. I thought, okay, I'm, I'm honored to do that. And then about 30 seconds before we walked in today, he told me the real reason why I'm speaking. He said, you are all I could afford, my daughter. <laughs> so, Ellen, I will try my best. Uh, so growing up outside of Chicago, like I did, uh, her best friend was this lovely lady here, Debbie, and, and she shared um, some stories with me that, that I'll share, and then I talked with Alan and the kids as well um, to share some fun stories, and, and everyone who knows Catherine knows there's a lot of fun stories. So as they grew up, Catherine, of course, loved the outdoors, and that continued to this day. Um, every day they'd go play across the street, the prairie, and they would cut mazes into the tall overgrown field and just play and play and play. There was a pond nearby that they built an island on, and they would play, and then the winters when it freeze, they would ice skate on as well. One of their favorites is they got to be, I guess, preteens and teenagers, is that they'd ride their bike over to Babe Ruth Field to watch the boys playing baseball. And they wouldn't really keep track of the score. They'd keep track of which boys they liked. <laughs> and Debbie said that would change each week, <laughs> which sounds kind of fickle, by the way. <laughs> um, as they grew up, she was the best kind of friend that a girl could have, right? They understood each other. Life is not always peaches and cream. Both girls knew that, and they could rely on each other. And as they got older, and months may go by before they see each other, they could see each other and just finish a conversation that had been months apart, and they grew so close. And as they both began to have families, the families would grow close too. They'd look forward to the summers when they could share each other. Um, and still today, the families are very close. So Catherine, or Kathy, depending on when you knew her. If you knew her pre-Allen, she's Kathy. Post-Allen, she became Catherine. Had a lot of loves that we talked about. You, you see the picture, she loved sunsets. She loved kids, all kids. She loved sweets, obviously loved her family. She loved sweets, <laughs> she loved sugar, and she also loved sweets. <laughs> and anything that had the word cake in it was okay with Catherine. Pound cake, cheesecake, sugar cake, fruit cake, sh short cake, cupcakes, Pancakes, wedding cakes, groom cakes, sweet cakes, rum cakes, angel cakes, little Debbie snack cakes, crab cakes, baby cakes. We're all okay with Catherine. We heard a moment ago about animals. 
She loved just about any animal and creature that God created except for fleas and ticks, which come from the devil. <laughs> and they attack God's creature. She didn't care for those. Everything else she did. So, so how much did she really love these animals? Ethan gave me a great illustration. One day they're driving to school, and to make it really dramatic, let's say it was raining hard. <laughs> and on the way she passed by somebody's garbage, and there was a cat scratch pole that somebody didn't want anymore. And she said, Ethan, can you get out and get the cat scratch pole? So he got it. And then she said, I need room in the car to take this home. Ethan, just keep walking this way. <laughs> So she proceeded to throw her son out of the car to take somebody else's cat scratch pole trash. Because man, this girl loved animals. Maddie shared that she loved SeaWorld. She got to go backstage and see Shamu, right? Right? And in a very Catherine way, she said, oh my gosh, Shamu, oh my gosh, Shamu, oh my gosh, Shamu. So she was very excited. Her favorite animal, though, was the stingray. They had to go a couple times, never wanted to leave. Catherine loved SeaWorld, she loved animals. And the girl also said some goofy stuff. So whenever she would get frustrated or mad, she would just mix words left and right. She would change the three names. So I, 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 got, I had the, the pleasure to go sit with her um, and visit when she was getting her first chemo treatment. And I asked about, you know, how'd you find out about this? How did this progress? And she said, well, you know, first I was visiting this doctor, that doctor, I thought maybe it was my thyroid. And the doctor said, you know, it, it might be leukemia, we need to test some more, or it might be your thyroid. She's like, okay, I'm sure it's my thyroid. So she went to work, it was confirmed, and when they called back, they called the house, so Alan answered, and Catherine was at work. She got home, opened the door, Alan's standing right there. She said, what are you doing? We gotta go to MD Anderson. Why? Because you have leukemia. We need to go right now. She goes, no, I don't, because that's stupid. <laughs> and so that's a, a very, uh, very Catherine type of statement to me. I love that. She's like, I don't have cancer because that's stupid. <laughs> and one of the favorites of the family recollects, um, they've gone skiing a few times, and one time they were driving up through New Mexico. And out of nowhere, Wow, those are some funny looking cows. Yeah, that's right. You know, it might be because those are donkeys. <laughs> so that's our gal, Catherine. Um, Catherine and, and Alan are just, I, I know that God put them together. They were so perfect for each other. They balanced each other out so well. Catherine, Catherine was not the woman she was without Alan. Alan is not the man, I know for sure, he is without Catherine. She helped him to be able to let down those walls, to become more sensitive, and really, really show him love. At the same time, Alan was able to build up that confidence that we talked about earlier. She was never really self-assured, and I'll talk about that more in a bit. But Alan was able to help her grow. She was able to help him grow a true marriage that God put together for a reason. You know, the kids represent each one of them very well, too. Maddie is mini Allen. She is. Ethan has Catherine's heart. He is little Catherine. Um, they very much match those, both of those, and it's just such a perfectly balanced family. Um, both Catherine and Allen, like all of us, had challenges. Uh, had backgrounds growing up where they really helped each other and really healed each other and still continue to do that. Alan did say there was only one man that he was ever jealous of and that was Clarence because Catherine always said everything looks good on Clarence. <laughs> <laughs> she was only shot to Clarence. <laughs> That's Alan's joke, not mine. <laughs> she wasn't a big shot girl. She wasn't a big fashion diva at all, but she loved Clarence, which is a big reason why I think she liked Baby Day so much. <laughs> and talking with everyone, there's just no bad memories. You know, she was such a loving soul, there are just not bad memories of her. So over the last four years, uh, I'm sorry, over the last 15 years, we've really been able to see her grow in her faith. And that's, that's a big part of what, what Alan wanted me to talk about. Um, we went through 
service to others. And they got to see that our situation can always be worse. And throughout the Sunday schools, throughout the Bible studies, throughout serving others, she's been really, really able to grow. And I have no doubt right now she's with the Father, not because she's my friend, not because that's what you say at funerals, not because she's a wonderful mother, a wonderful wife, but because she knows Christ and she has accepted that grace. And even if she wasn't self-assured and thought, oh, little old me, I know that's where she is because she accepted that grace and her growth in, in faith has been really strong. And th this week I'm working at a UM Army up in Lufkin and, and Sunday uh, the pastor was, was talking about somebody else who was struggling, which was, which was a need God wanted to share. So John Wesley, the founder of what we now refer to as the Methodist movement, also had those challenges. And in 1738, as he had his big experience, um, he wrote in his journal, in the evening I went very unwillingly to a society on Aldersgate Street, where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. About a quarter to nine, he was describing the change that God works in his heart through faith in Christ. I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. And so Methodism became about grace. And while Catherine may have thought others are more important than me, or I don't deserve this, that's what grace is about. And even John Wesley had those same fears. Am I, am I not worthy of this? How can you take even mine? Well, I have no doubt that's where Catherine is right now with the Father. Um, and she has accepted that grace and has that relationship with Christ. So here we are celebrating the life of Catherine. Um, she would not believe how many people were here. If she was standing here, she would say, you're not here for me, come on, come on. right? Um, the Law Center where she works. Friends and alumni have set up a scholarship fund almost immediately, the Catherine Wright Memorial Scholarship Fund. That shows you what they think of her, right? She wasn't just an employee, she was part of the family that we have a scholarship fund set up already. And that particular fund is to help law students or recent graduates who exhibit her same caring, compassion, and kindness, which is going to be very hard to match. But it just shows you how much she meant to them and all of us being here as well. All of the posts, all of the people who were here, all the offers for help. So the last few weeks have really been a whirlwind. Um, and I know the family's going to have trouble remembering everything. And so I, I'd like to kind of uh, for us to help demonstrate for them if, uh, if, I, if I can get through this. So if you guys could just close your eyes for a minute. So over the last few weeks, if you were able to visit the hospital, if you wouldn't mind standing up, just for a moment. If you provided a meal, or gave a ride, or hung out, or checked on them, if you'd be willing to in the future, drop by, take the kids out for a meal, please stand up. If you would be willing to take Maddie shopping for a dress, but not a justice, because she does not like justice, <laughs> then please stand up. If you'd be willing to call, text, order a pizza for, please stand up. If you'd be willing to take Ethan shopping for shoes, but not the kind that he wants, because those cost way too much, Ethan, <laughs> stand up. That boy loves fashion. If you'd be willing to teach Alan how to braid hair, please stand up. I can help with that now. <laughs> if you'd be willing to drop by, let out the dogs, and maybe, maybe while you're there, accidentally swap out all of Alan's cowboy gear with Texans gear, <laughs> please stand up. If you're willing to help build a new fence when it falls down, stand up. Okay, so open your eyes, guys, and turn around for a second. So, <laughs> we're not Catherine, we're not your mom, we're not your wife, we never will be, but what we are is your family. And this is a Christian community, and we love you, and we're always going to be for you, there for you. And so what I challenge all of us who are standing to do is, these next hours and days are going to be really, really hard. What's going to be harder and what's more important is to do all those things and offer them and check on them three weeks from now, five months from now, four years from now. 
to stay with them. Whenever you're not sure what to do, just send a text, hey, how are you doing? Can I bring dinner by? So it's so important in the long run to be able to do that. Thank you guys and have a seat. And Alan, I just want to thank you for the honor to get up here and talk about Catherine um, and talk about our program. Michael, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like you to hear these words from Scripture. Uh, this uh, first text is taken from Matthew's Gospel, uh, the 6th chapter beginning with the 25th, and I'm going to read through the 34th verse, Matthew 6, 25-34. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body. What you will wear is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you be worrying by worrying at a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore don't worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. And then this passage from John's Gospel. This is the assurance that Jesus gives to his disciples on the night before his crucifixion. This is from the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John. And Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go and prepare a place for you? And when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the place that I am going. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will, because I live, you also will live. I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. And then these, the last word, Jesus speaks to all of his disciples. Peace I live with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you, so let not your hearts be troubled, and neither let them be afraid. I pray today that the readings from these two gospel lessons will touch our hearts with the peace of God which passes all understanding. I'm going to confess to you this afternoon that the shock of this of Catherine's death has stunned us all. We use the word tragedy way too often in our society, but there are certainly those occasions that are tragic, and this is one. Alan and Catherine knew something about tragedy in their own lives. For those of us who knew Catherine, and I think Catherine had about a thousand best friends, this occasion in our church has something of the air of unreality about it. We just can't believe that this has happened. And for her family, this event is something like a nightmare from which they hope to wake up. The suddenness of Catherine's passing, from the announcement of her illness to her death, just leaves us stunned. Now we know that however hard we try, that none of us can enter into the kind of desolate world that Alan and the kids 
and those who are close to her really feel. It's very difficult for us to share that pain and that loss. Michael did an extraordinary job, an extraordinary job sharing that with us. But ultimately, this kind of deep sorrow is something that only they know deep within. It's almost stark, private, and exclusive, this kind of grief and loss. In this sense, as many of us as are gathered here, we're really sort of outsiders to the kind of mourning that they're going through. And in fact today, God and God's grace and God's love for us may well have become simply emotionally eclipsed because we are gripped in such heartbreak that it is bleak and leaves us vacant at heart. I will tell you that there are often tragic moments in life when we stand alone before the mystery of death. However, in the midst of all this, Alan and the kids and those who love Catherine, we are all here as members of a larger family, for we belong to a family of faith and trust and hope and grace. We belong to a community that is brought together by the love and grace that is ours in Christ Jesus. And we are bound to one another in a special form of friendship that is the community of faith itself. And here's why we're bound. We believe and trust that before any of us, before the deaths that we have faced, and before Catherine's death, there is one who has gone before us, who has gone through death itself, and has conquered. Has conquered the evil that is death, so that we might have the strength to face it in our own lives. Mary, the mother of Jesus, had a child who suffered a violent death before her eyes. She understood something of the unspeakable sorrow of sudden bereavement, not unlike what we face today. But we know this today. We know that Jesus went through death so that we might have life. And so that Catherine might have life. The events of his death and resurrection are a mystery that we enter only through faith. Only through faith. I hope you noticed as you came into the sanctuary today, a round table, that carried some important things in Catherine's life. Many of those things have already been mentioned. Her love for the beach, her love of animals her deep love for her family. All those are represented in items that are on that table. But perhaps if you looked at it, you saw not only the sandals that she wore almost everywhere, but you also saw a little fish okay, called Dory. Okay? Those of you who have children uh, that are of the age saw Finding Nemo about a thousand times, okay? over and over again. But now remember one line that Dory spoke that spoke worlds to Catherine and to the rest of us. When Dory was confused, she would say, keep on swimming. Just keep on swimming. Today, what we say is, keep on sharing the faith that is ours in Christ Jesus. You offer that today. You offer it in your presence and in your prayers and in the hope that is ours. We celebrate today the life of one that we loved. But we lean today on the love that we have for one another. We are hard pressed and pushed on today. But I pray that the solidarity of our friendship and faith will hold us together in the sure trust of hope, in the hope of everlasting life. John, as you began the service today, mentioned the eighth chapter of Romans. 
Paul responded to a community such as ours at a time of deep loss. And he asked a question, what can we say to this? And is that not our question? Though? What can we say to this? And then he responded, if God is for us, who can be against us? Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? How? Forgive me. We are more than conquerors than him who loved us. I am confident, friends, that Catherine now enjoys a fullness of life that is beyond my comprehension, a fulfillment that for her will last forever, and a fulfillment that awaits us as well. Friends, we give thanks for the love that is ours in Christ Jesus.